All right, welcome back. I hope you're having an amazing time so far. Our next speaker is David Dalby. He is the CTO of John Snow Labs. Please join me in welcoming David to our virtual stage. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and welcome everyone. My goal today is uh, to help you with your uh, clinical data abstraction project. So uh, if you, you're helping the world of medicine by um, learning to automatically extract data from, from documents and uh, making, making them easier to analyze, to understand what's happening to people, uh, this should help. Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is really why is clinical data abstraction such a big challenge? And here's in general what, what we are trying to do here. Uh, all across healthcare, we, we have documents that could be, you know, it could be images, could be tables, could be academic papers, could be audiology reports, lab reports. And the general task is to take them and put them into a nice structured format so that we can, you know, we, we, can, we can analyze them, we can summarize them, we can visualize them, you know, we can do what we do with classic relational data. Today, this is something that is mostly done manually, and that's a problem. Uh, because it means that most of this data really we just never get to. It's just too slow, too expensive. Uh, another thing that's even somewhat unique to healthcare compared to um, you know, retail, e-commerce, cybersecurity, is that uh, in many specialties, and this example is from oncology, most of the clinically really relevant data is, is only going to be in free text. Uh, this is from a study that was done by uh, one of the top five pharma companies in the world. Uh, they were looking to uh, take oncology data and, and be able to apply clinical guidelines, right? So understand, okay, if this is the patient, here's the, where they are in the disease. Therefore, by the literature, here's the next right action for them. And what they found that out of about 300 data points that they needed to make those decisions, so, you know, where is the tumor, patient demographics, uh, prescriptions, previous, previous conditions, uh, only 40% of those were available in structured data. Everything else was not only in text, but in text like this. So it's completely unstructured, it's specialty specific, it requires OCR sometimes, and, and so on. Healthcare systems uh, see this challenge all the time, and healthcare systems usually employ dozens, if not hundreds, uh, of people who are clinical data abstractors manually, uh, because a US hospital on average participates in five to 10 uh, patient registries. A patient registry is, is usually a disease-specific uh, database where a structured data about each patient is, is added in. So for example, if someone has a, you know, has a heart attack, goes through cancer, uh, has a baby, right? Usually there'd be a record for them with, could be three, four, five, six hundred fields about what happened with that specific event so that we can analyze populations over time, right? So, so for example, today we care a lot about what happens to people who receive the COVID vaccines. What happened to people who had COVID you know, a year ago? How, how healthy are they? Uh, but of course, just as we care about COVID, we still care about cancer, Alzheimer, chronic pain, right? Uh, you know, childbirth, right? And other, other conditions. This is largely an LP challenge uh, because even if you know to do things that are clinically super simple, like what's my you know, blood pressure, cholesterol, sugar level, mostly you'd have texts like this, plan follow up with dietitian to manage hypertension and borderline LDL and increase dosage of that, that, that. Uh, really what we need to get out of it, first of all, that there is a plan, that's a Boolean field, uh, that there is hypertension, uh, there is no cholesterol problem because LDL is borderline, so you know, it's, not, uh, it's not bad yet, right, and so on. So, so as you can see, to understand this, you need to understand that borderline LDL, first of all, refers to cholesterol, it means that you know, you're not diagnosed with the disease, you need to understand sometimes, you know, if you're taking this drug, what does it mean that you have, you need to see which measurements and which dates refers to which things, uh, so, so you need a, a fairly small domain specific, either clinician or software, a software model that can do that for you. From the pharma side, uh, you have very, you have really you have very similar problems when, you, when you're doing clinical trials, uh, which you do at scale, right? So, you know, if you have a COVID vaccine, you have tens of thousands of people. We need to collect the data very quickly. Each one of them, your forms, you need to understand everything that happens to them. If they got, you know, the, the, they're on the trial, Every time they have you know, a fever, a pain, some other medication, any condition, you need to know about it, you need to fill it in, you need to fill in uh, their, uh, uh, you know, their, their labs and their vitals. You also need to track the researchers, the doctors, the dosages, the sites, uh, everything around it. So each clinical trial creates at least hundreds of thousands of documents that need to be summarized, analyzed, so we can see, okay, you know, here is, yeah, 
is this drug working? Is this drug safe? And so on. Uh, and this is also something that, that's still mostly done manually today because you have issues with uh, handwriting, you have issues with multilingual data, uh, issues with really just people uh, using different jargon uh, to do the same things. As a result of this, uh, of the fact that, that really uh, today, a lot of this data is now av available as digital text, right? So we used to just write it in paper forms and summarize it in paper forms, now it is on our computer. Uh, so we have the free text, uh, so that's on, on one hand. On the other hand, NLP technology has actually, actually gotten much better. So there's more of this when we can automate now. Uh, some of these things really for the first time in history, we're accurate enough to automate. And results, NLP is really becoming foundational uh, health IT technology. The slide you're seeing here is from the, the most recent uh, gradient flow report, the Healthcare AI survey. It's an industry survey focused on practitioners published just, just two months ago uh, in March, 2021. And one of the questions was around what are the foundational technologies to use as a healthcare AI team or company. And the four main technologies, kind of really the core ones are data integration, NLP, business intelligence, and data warehousing. And really NLP is the only new one. The other ones, they've been there for two, three decades and they will be there for two, three decades. But what we are seeing is that being able to understand language and specifically understand clinical language correctly and automatically is becoming uh, something that's very broadly applicable. So that's the challenge. Uh, we have, uh, and, and really we have um, hundreds of thousands of people employed in doing this uh, manually today, uh, but there's the, the need is so much more than what, what people can do uh, because a lot of data just never gets looked at. So, so let's see what is the best we can do. And, uh, and we're looking at it. Uh, and the goal, uh, my goal here today is to show you what is the current state of the art. Uh, so you can see really what works and, and whether or not this fits your project. Uh, so for that, I mean, I, just to explain why, my, why I'm the one speaking about this. Uh, so I'm the CTO at John Snow Labs. Uh, John Snow Labs is, a, is a, an AI and LP company uh, fully focused on natural language processing in healthcare and life science. Uh, it's, it's fairly well known within the industry and won a number of, uh, of awards uh, around our work, both in the open source arena as well as we working with some of the largest health systems and pharma companies around the world. Johnson Labs is most well known because of Spark and LP. That's our baby. So there's the open source project, which, which is by far, you know, for three years in a row by, by the O'Reilly surveys, it's the most widely used NLP library in the enterprise. It's available in over 200 languages, supports a number of state-of-the-art deep learning and transfer learning models. Um, and yeah, uh, can be used on different platforms, widely used and so forth. Uh, Spark and P4 Healthcare uh, is our main product. And um, per the, the previous last survey from Gradian Flow, uh, this is the NLP industry survey. It's, it's, the, major, it's the, the most commonly used library in healthcare. 54% of healthcare AI teams use Spark NLP to analyze and unstructured clinical or biomedical data. Uh, and you can also see the results around just growth. And this is just from the beginning to the end of 2020, a 9x growth in terms of downloads of Spark NLP. Uh, so, so in general, what you're hearing here uh, you know, describes uh, the most commonly used library within the industry. Uh, but what I'd like to focus is uh, on what is the state of the art, right? And what's kind of what you should compare with and what you should expect. Um, and, and the first thing to say is that state of the art is not a marketing term, uh, it's not a fluff term. It's an academic term. Uh, when you say that you achieved or improved the state of or obtained new state of the art, uh, what you're saying is that you have a peer reviewed paper that's been published that uh, measures accuracy on a, a public reproducible academic benchmark, right? So not your own data, not your own metric. Uh, and that, uh, that benchmark is competitive, right? So because it's public and academic, others have tried to optimize and improve that one. And right now you hold the best result. Uh, so when we say that we, we, you know, we have state of doubt that you see for a certain uh, benchmark, right, or certain tasks, it, we mean it in the sense that, yes, look, here, here are peer-reviewed papers, here's the code, you can reproduce this, uh, right? Uh, no one else is claiming uh, to, to have done the same as to have reached that level. Um, on top of it, uh, we are not just looking at academic results, we are looking at a uh, real-world production system, so we have two more criteria. Uh, we, are, uh, we want systems that are in production, in production in multiple places, Right, so this is not a one-off project that was run in one place. This is something that generalizes that is reusable across different organizations and use cases. 
uh, and require that uh, some of the code at least have you know, either open source or open core, uh, so that we can see really, okay, this is, this is the actual software solution, right? And it's not a wrapper you know, on something else. So here's an example, here's one task. Uh, the core task uh, that, that you need a machine to be able to do when you're uh, doing clinical data abstraction is recognizing clinical entities. And in this example, for example, you can see text, and there are three types of entities that we are interested in, medical problems, medical treatments, and medical tests. Uh, and, and of course, you may have other NER models that look for you know, drugs, uh, gene products, anatomy, and, and so on. Uh, but here we want a model to know, for example, that the gestational diabetes mellitus, those three words are one term, uh, and that term is a, is a medical problem, right? And we want to know that, uh, uh, for example, if we have a, you know, a blood pressure screening, that also those three words would be one term, and that term would be a medical test. So that's what an NER model should do. And when we say a statement like, oh, Sparking Vivo Healthcare is state of the art, clinical NER, here's what we mean. So first of all, right now, if you go to uh, Papers We Code, which is a website that wrecks uh, about 4,000 different benchmarks, about 40,000 papers, and basically it breaks the state of the art for those public benchmarks, and you go to the medical name entity recognition category, uh, there are 11 benchmarks there right now for eight of them, Spark and LP, is the, is the top result, right? So basically it's the most accurate you know, peer reviewed result on that model ever. Uh, papers with code also requires that you also publish code uh, so people can, other researchers can only reproduce your work, right? Uh, uh, hopefully so they can improve on it, right? And, and you know, look at it, say, hey, we can do better, do better, and then science makes focus. That's the plan. Uh, but that's, that's the core. State of the art means that this is the most accurate results on public reproducible benchmarks ever. The second important thing as part of being applied, an applied state of the art solution is having real world uses in the real world. Because as you know, there's a, there's a big, big difference between something that works on one nice academic data set and something that works on you know, real noisy data within a high compliance scalable environment. And, and here, not only that, you know, we, we have this running in production in multiple places, we have actually multiple public case studies on technical talks in conference like you know, AI for Health, Data Plus AI Summit, OVSC, O'Reilly AI, other conferences where we've shown use cases. Then we showed here's the NLP or deep learning pipeline and here are the results. And, and uh, basically, uh, if you start a project, this is probably where you want to start. Uh, because one thing is to believe the, the, the metrics and believe the models, but another thing is to see, okay, when you take this to production, here are the other lessons learned, uh, the other things you should pay attention to, how you put the whole system together, which is what uh, many of these uh, technical talks are about. Uh, the third thing that, that you need the solution uh, to be is really be optimized for modern compute platforms, uh, which is something that we spend a lot of time on and uh, making sure you know, this actually makes the most of the hardware you have and the, the data science or analytic platforms that you have put in place. Uh, so a month ago, we released Spark and LP3, which is a major release, uh, and other than support for Spark 3 and other libraries, uh, it's, it achieves, and you can see, massive, massive speed ups. Uh, and, and this is really the work of just months of profiling optimization uh, to squeeze the most of, of the hardware that we have, optimize memory, optimize runtimes. So compared to the previous version, you can see, and this is on um, AWS Databricks, we're almost eight times faster in calculating the large we were three times faster in calculating name entity recognition uh, with deep learning uh, on GPUs compared to the previous version. And there's also a speed up in CPUs as well, uh, although smaller. The other thing uh, that we worry about is just really making sure we have production grade tested scalable solution on all of the recent compute pl platforms. So whether you're running locally, uh, Linux, Mac, and Windows are supported, you're running within containers, you have kind of something dockerized with or without Kubernetes. Oh, of course, if you need to scale this to a large cluster. Uh, so whether you're using you know, Spark locally, you're using Databricks, you're using Cloudera, you're on AWS, Azure, GCP, EMR, uh, all of those, they're not only supported, we actually test on them, we optimize on them. We make it easy to integrate, secure, and so on. Uh, so the goal is, is, first of all, have the state of that academic solution, uh, but then make sure that it's not just an academic solution, right? This is actually something that uh, real world companies with the requirements of compliance, security, and scale of healthcare in it. Other than name entity recognition, there are several other tasks that you need to have in place if you're looking to do 
clinical data abstraction. It, one of them is clinical assertion status detection. And that's a separate problem. And we have separate deep learning models, also trainable that, that do that. Uh, and the goal is to come say, okay, once you have an entity, so you think something happened, uh, really the question is, uh, does the patient have this, does not have it, maybe someone else has this. So for example, a peer, patient with severe fever and sore throat, okay, so uh, both of them are recognized as problems, uh, but they're also present, meaning that they're present, the patient has them. On the other end, he shows no stomach pain. So stomach pain is a problem, but it's absent, right? The patient does not have stomach pain. If you continue to, to the next line, he also became short of breath when climbing a flight of stairs. So short of breath is, a, of course, a medical symptom, but it's conditional. It only happens when he climbs the flight of stairs. It doesn't happen all the time. And uh, at the end, we have father with Alzheimer. So Alzheimer is, of course, very important clinically, but it's just as important to know that this is associated with someone else, with not, not with the patient. Right? Otherwise, of course, you cannot make any clinical decision, uh, right? You know, build the patient cohort. You'll just have any correct clinical data abstraction of decision making based on this text. Uh, so, so the goal of uh, clinical assertion status detection is to come say, okay, once that you have a you know with an entity, really, what what are we asserting about it? Are we saying the patient has it, does not have it, had it ten years ago, somebody else had it, uh, you know, or, or, you know, we they we still suspect it will have. So within the current, uh, this slide shows you the current state of the art metrics, and, and you have the link to the, uh, the actual published paper, uh, a published peer reviewed paper that's most recent in this case. So that includes the latest bench benchmark. Uh, we are happy to report that on the, really the main benchmark used uh, for uh, academically for assertion status, we also were able to improve the latest uh, state of the art. So we're able to achieve new state of the art accuracy. Uh, and just like any art, this is also, this is a production grade widely deployed model. Another uh, interesting NLP task that you need to solve is uh, finding relationships between different entities. So for example, finding whether something happened before something else. Okay, so uh, am I taking the drug because I have the symptom or uh, did the symptom start after I started taking the drug, right? And maybe it's a side effect, right? This is super important. Uh, similarly, something to have other relations, uh, like the relationship between, uh, just between the, the disease and the drug. Okay, so not just the temporal. Uh, this is between body parts and uh, uh, you know a symptom. Like, you know, really, where does it hurt? Okay, uh, uh, you know uh, uh, what 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 finger was broken and so on. So different relations we want to build. So relation extraction really, that's a separate deep learning problem, uh, right? You can find different relationships, and there are many many types of different relations. Uh, right now we ship it over thirty pre-trained relation extraction models, uh, but also the model is trainable because you may care about different relationships and want to train your own. Uh, so here, at least for uh, three new, uh, uh, three types of relationships. So one is relations between symptoms, procedures, and treatments. The second is uh, relations uh, bio in biomedical data between genes and human phenotype. And the third is relations also within kind of academ within academic papers within chemicals and proteins. We are happy to report that we've achieved new state of doubt accuracy. Uh, on other ones, as you can see, we're not there yet. We've improved accuracy, but we are working on it as well. Another very important task that you almost always need as part of any project that looks at medical you know, text, images, data, is uh, be able to de-identify the data. And the other thing is especially challenging if you have free text. So you have a you know, patient, I Ching, 25 month years old, and you know, this is kind of in the source, more in Beijing, was transferred to John Hopkins. Uh, what you want is you want to be able to identify things like, oh, look, we have a name here, we have an age, we have where they were born, and we have the hospital we were transferred to. All of this is sensitive data that you may want to mask this way. You may also want to, uh, to obfuscate the data. Obfuscation means that you don't delete the data, you replace it basically with another random value. So here's an obfuscation, we can see we have patient Blondie, 35 years old, born in Talihina, transferred to Mid Columbia Medical Center. And this is not only more readable, uh, this also works if, if you missed one, right? So let's say you, you, know, you missed John Hopkins, you left it as John Hopkins. Right, because your model, either the, the human who did this or the Ottoman model who did this is, is, you know, is not perfect. You'd still not be able, you, you, if it's obfuscated, you're not able to tell, right, between the original, the obfuscated version, right? Versus if you only had tagging, you, you'd know if something was, was missed. Therefore, obfuscation is a very popular text identification method. Uh, real world identification goes far beyond just looking at text, uh, because first of all, uh, you don't, you not only have text, you may have PDFs, uh, you know, more documents, 
DICOM images, medical imaging, uh, uh, so, so you have kind of uh, just more complex uh, technical requirements on how and what you need to de-identify. Uh, the requirements on what you need to de-identify, they change. For example, between the you know, US and Europe and Canada, there are basically different tools on what does it mean to correctly de-identify, what needs to happen. Uh, and the other thing uh, you usually need to do is you need to link a single patient. So you may have some data as structured data, some data as a you know, PDF file and then a medical image. You want to de-identify all of them, but still link them to the same patient. Uh, so there are a lot of practical challenges that we deal with, but we'll not cover here. Uh, what I do want to say is that um, on the um, on the most widely used the identification uh, public academic benchmark, which is the 2014 N2C2 benchmark, we've also recently achieved a new state new state of doubt accuracy. And Spark and P4 Health includes a, a model that does that, uh, and also the production grade trainable scalable. So a, a typical uh, flow uh, of uh, information extraction pipeline would have multiple steps to so get data you may or not uh, may or may not need to extract text from images you need to de-identify you may need to classify to say oh is this a pathology report or lab report or something else and then you can extract entities statuses and maybe link them to, to a terminology and usually you would build those uh, nlp pipeline as they're called and be able to train them and, and it does get it definitely does get complex but but of course that's what we need the last thing I want to cover are just a, a few tips and lessons learned uh, from, from the, the real world projects we've done over the past five years in those areas. Uh, so one thing, as I've already discussed, there's a big, big difference between an academic result and a production system. Uh, you know, having an academic paper or having some open source code that does something uh, is usually years away from something that can actually work in a real world healthcare system. Uh, everything from privacy, security, tuning custom models, scalability, hardware optimization, explainability, reproducibility, or really just having you know, the documentation, the webinars, the blog posts, the public notebooks, and kind of the, the community support around software. Uh, so make sure when you choose a solution, choose a solution you can actually use in practice. The second thing to remember is uh, healthcare is not one language. Uh, and one, one mistake you should not make is, is uh, go to someone and says, oh, we do, you know, we understand healthcare and LP understand healthcare. We know everything about healthcare. Healthcare is in hundreds of languages. A, a dentist cannot read what an oncologist write, and that those two cannot read what a cardiologist write, and those two cannot read a, you know, what, 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 a, what the next generation sequencing report would say. Those are completely different languages. It takes people years to master them. This is why you go to med school, this is why you specialize. A, what it means is means that the algorithms, the models, the semantics, a, the terminologies are completely different. And it means that you know, if you're doing a project in a clinical data abstraction and say ophthalmology, right, you would probably will need to train your own models. Uh, so what you need, you want uh, to have a software or library that is trainable. And what you're seeing on the screen, this is our data annotation tool. Uh, we also have, uh, you, you will probably also need uh, medical professionals, clinicians to go and annotate label data, uh, you know, mark data so that uh, you can then train uh, your algorithms to understand how to extract data automatically. Uh, sometimes uh, after you train enough, uh, train enough examples, uh, you'll feel confident enough to just automate your clinical data abstraction. Most commonly, uh, because uh, really look, if you're working, you know, if you're doing this for clinical trial, you're doing this for, you know, to actually decide what to do next with patients, you need near perfect accuracy. Uh, you would want to keep humans in the loop meaning that uh, you want the software to run, you want the software to automatically extract the data, but then you want to show it in user interface like what you've seen in the annotation tool, where the software can show a human, a human expert, like a clinician. Here's what we extracted automatically, right? Here's where the evidence is, here's kind of explain, uh, explaining, here's where it is in the document. And, and then what we can do, a, a human can validate it, fix it. If they do fix it, as you see, as you see here, uh, we use the validation data, basically, uh, we use the changes as new label data, so we can retrain the model. Once we retrain the model with active learning, uh, the model, basically, you have a new version of the model that's improved, and that new version of the model is used to annotate future documents. Uh, and, and this is basically how we have, we have this active learning loop, where humans, on one hand, correct what the system is doing, uh, right, and make sure that that individual document is correct. On the other hand, they're actually training the, the next version of the model to do better. Uh, and that's uh, really the, usually the fastest way and most effective way to start your clinical data abstraction project. 
So that is what I wanted to cover. Um, so um, really the, the main thing to know is uh, things have changed even just in the last two years in terms of achievable accuracy, uh, things that were just uh, not, not practical, not achievable three, four years ago are achievable today. Um, so uh, you have the links to some live demos. Uh, you can try the software yourself uh, you know, to see if, if this or other similar software packages can work uh, for you and enable you to get much more, uh, much more data about patients faster and help us all together move healthcare a little bit faster. Thank you and good luck. Awesome, thank you so much, David. If you can stop uh, sharing your screen right now, I know the virtual crowd is going wild with applause. <laughs> so thank you so much for sharing with us. For the audience, it's time for you to make your way to your next session. Along the way, make sure you accept your connection request and take some time to check out our amazing AI exhibits. Thanks so much and we'll see you around.